folks. Good morning. It is Tuesday, September 29, 2020, and we are continuing our lecture on the French Revolution today. I probably am not going to go the whole class with lecture as I've been doing, um, in part to spare my voice because I have a really long day of lecture that I have to do tomorrow. And you can already probably hear in my voice that it's getting a little bit raspy from, um, from lecturing all day yesterday. Um, but also because I have some other assignments that I'm going to give out to you guys and um, have you work on those for the remainder of class today, including the second part of the vocabulary. Just to put this on your radar, we are coming up towards the end of this unit. I suspect that we'll probably be lecturing today as well as on Thursday and then a little bit on Friday. And then, um, and then next week we'll probably be getting pretty close to, to taking the test. So um, probably I would say plan for the test in about a week here, I would imagine, somewhere in that neighborhood, probably next Tuesday, a week from today. Just to bring you up to speed on where we left off talking about the French Revolution, um, we have gotten our way through the first several um, uh, events, uh, major events of the French Revolution, uh, as a little bit of a reminder to you, we started off with a system in France that was an old, old system, an old regime, as they called it, where there were three different estates, the first, the second, and the third estate. And the first and second estate were the privileged estates, but they only made up about roughly combined 3% of the population, whereas the third estate made up 97% of the population. In particular, within the, in the third estate, the bourgeoisie, uh, which is the upper middle class people in France who were relatively educated, began to challenge the estate's general meeting. and. Um, and they threw off the title of third estate and they started calling each other the Nas National <clears throat> Assembly. The National Assembly um, wrote various uh, documents, including the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It also wrote the new constitution, which the French people started using in 1791. Um, in 1791, they still had a king in power Louis the Sixteenth, but as we found out, Louis the Sixteenth's time was cut short um, because of his attempted escape, and um, you know which failed. He was brought back to Paris. He lost the confidence of everybody, and then a year after they had declared this new legislative assembly, which was the second major body of government, they then threw off the legislative assembly. Um, set aside the Constitution they had just completed a year back because of various, um, you know, massacres and, and chaos that were reigning free in Paris. And as a byproduct of that, throwing the Legislative Assembly off, the radicals that had been in charge, the Jacobin Club, under the leadership of Maximilien Robespierre and others, came into power. And the National Convention was the most radical form of government where, um, you know, they, they started using the guillotine in unprecedented levels to execute people who were um, suspected, um, you know, uh, suspected anti-revolutionaries. Um, the National Convention was the most radical form of the re revolution be the, because they were doing the most radical changes. They completely tried to de-Christianize France. They changed the calendar of France. They threw off all ancient um, feudal ties. Um, and it's really a lot of change, but it's a lot of chaos as well. And because of the chaos, they're trying to control that chaos by utilizing the death penalty and executing people with the guillotine. And then we talked about how the reign of terror went on for a couple of years. The Committee of Public Safety uh, was kind of a funny name for, for a committee of high-ranking Jacobin club officials who were using the committee to execute a bunch of people who likely weren't even really anti-revolutionary. But the state became very, very, very um, 
punishing in terms of the number of people that they uh, executed. And um, George Dantone, who was a friend of Maximilian Robespierre, suggests that maybe the maybe the reign of terror should come to an end. Robespierre turns on him, has George Dantone executed without being able to defend himself. And then when Robespierre, about a month later, comes back to the National Convention, he gives a speech where he says, I have a list of people, but I'm not going to tell you who's on the list. And everybody freaks out, and they're worried that they're going to be the next to get their heads chopped off by the, by the guillotine. And Maximilian Robespierre um, ends up having his own execution take place, where, National, where Robespierre, the National Convention, has him arrested and executed, and the reign of terror officially ended on July 28, 1794. We're now five years into the revolution by this point, and we've already seen a number of different very chaotic um, phases of the French Revolution. And the next one is going to bring more stability. Um, however, it is going to have problems. And the next one is known as the Directory. Now, we don't talk as much about the Directory because um, there's not a whole lot of... Um, the, the French Revolution, when the Directory comes to power, people were really tired of the reign of terror, and they had been living in fear for a very long time, and that wears people down. And so, you know, by the time that the Directory comes into place as the new government of France, um, people are are people are kind of ready to like put the executions aside. They're ready for things to kind of cool down a little bit and not be so chaotic. But the directory has some problems. Um, it's really difficult for the directory to get laws passed that are in favor of um, the people, and the directory ends up being kind of um, corrupt. Okay. Um, as years go on, the directory demonstrates itself to be somewhat incapable of meeting the needs of the people, and it increasingly is pay paying favors to the wealthiest segments of society. Um, and, and so it's, it, the directory just is, is corrupt and it has problems with it, and that's where the next major figure in our story comes into place, and his name is Napoleon. So Napoleon was born in 1769, uh, a full 20 years before the start of the French Revolution, which happens in 1789. So when the French Revolution breaks out, Napoleon's about 20 years old, just a little older than you guys are. By that point, he had already been in military school for over half his life, because he gets sent to military school at age 9. Now, Napoleon was not technically Excuse me, Napoleon was not technically born in France. He was born on an island that was at the time controlled by France called Corsica. Corsica is still there, but now it's controlled by Italy. And um, so Corsica at the time was, was, was controlled by France. That's where Napoleon is born. And he's kind of a lesser noble. Napoleon is of noble birth, but he's like a lesser noble. He's not... He's not one of the high-ranking nobles that lived at the Palace of Versailles with Louis XVI or something like that. Napoleon is, is from a distant region that France only has kind of tenuous control over um, at the time. And so he's a noble, but, you know, he's a lesser noble. Um, and so, you know, I know that we've talked about in the French Revolution... Um, you know, the, the third estate was really against the nobility, the, the second estate, right? Because the nobles were the ones who didn't want to be taxed. And so your first knee-jerk reaction might be, well, how does Napoleon end up becoming like a hero of the French Revolution when he was himself part of the second estate? And it's kind of like one of those things where some nobles, because they weren't really close with the king, they kind of got a hall pass on that. And so um, people respected Napoleon not only because... Um, he was like, you know, he was, he had gone to military school, but also because um, he comes and, and there were royalist rebels in October. The, the National Convention is, is, is still technically in place, kind of into 1794, 1795, and the directory is like taking that over. It's like a transitionary phase. But so right as soon as the National Convention 
aka the directory, is um, getting started. Okay, um, Na Napoleon um, had by by sixteen he was a lieutenant in the artillery. Now, what does that mean? A lieutenant is a low-ranking officer, okay? It's one of the lowest ranks of the officer ranks. There's two different classes of ranks in the military. There's what's known as the enlisted ranks. These are going to be your everyday common people in the military. And, and you know, you can serve in the enlisted ranks all your life and rise up to the top levels of the enlisted ranks. And on the first day on the job, a lieutenant who is an officer is going to outrank you. So there's a whole other class of ranks within the military known as officer positions or officer ranks. And, um, and Napoleon is an officer, which is classic for this time because typically the only people who were allowed to serve as officers in militaries in Europe at this time were noble-born people. Uh, that's one of the changes that Napoleon is going to make. Napoleon starts raising people to become officers based on their merit, based on how good of, of soldiers they are, how smart they are with battles and stuff like that. And so Napoleon will make that change later on. But in his early days, during the start of the French Revolution, he joined the new government army. So he was an officer who served you know, in favor of the French Revolution very early on. Um, and so he starts to build some credibility with the revolution because he is serving the revolutionary government's military. And um, that's even during the years of the National Convention when he's still a young man. He's probably only in about 22, 23 at that point. In October of 1795, there were these royalists. Now, the king by this point was already dead, but there are still people who are very conservative who wanted to reinstate a monarch in France and, and turn France back into an absolutist monarchy. And in 1795, these royalists um, march on the, on the government, on the directory. And um, Napoleon uh, leads a defense of the directory and repels thousands of royalists um, and, and as a byproduct of his success in defending against this attempted coup, um, a coup is like a, trying to overthrow the government, okay, which Napoleon himself will do later on. But in defending the, the directory against this coup, he gets hailed as a hero. He had a quote. He, he said that he defended the directory with what he called a whiff of grape shot grape, like grapes, like wine grapes, okay, um, he, a whiff of grape shot, grape shot is, so I told you he's in the artillery, the other thing that you need to know about the, the militaries of this time is that the militaries are divided into different regiments, so you have like the artillery, which is going to be cannons and gunfire and stuff like that, uh, and that's what Napoleon's, um, you know, emphasis in his training was on. But you also have other segments. You have the infantry. The infantry are going to be your soldiers who are carrying weapons, who are on the front lines. You have your cavalry. Your cavalry are going to be, um, um, they're going to be your, your horses, your guys on horseback, okay? Um, and then you have your navy, of course. And so, in the in the military, in the in the French army, he's in the artillery, and um, because he was a specialist in cannons, so you have these. You you kind of kind of picture this in your head. He's leading a defense of the of the directory of the government. So he has his troops stationed around the around the governmental building that the directory meets in, defending them. And then they have these royalist rebels who are marching to try to take over the government. And he loads the artillery with a particular kind of shot called grape shot. And the way that grape shot works is um, similar to with a shotgun, a shotgun um, slug or a shotgun um, cartridge. Um, not a slug, but a cartridge has a bunch of BBs in it, like little little metal balls, okay? Um, and there's different sizes of BBs that you can buy. So you can buy buckshot, you can buy birdshot, okay? Um, the, with cannons, you can load up cannons with a cannonball, 
okay, which is huge and probably weighs about, I don't know, 12 pounds and it'll blow a hole in the side of a building or in the side of a ship, but that's not really appropriate to be using on crowds. And so um, he loaded up the cannons with grape shot and grape shot is um, basically think of it as being pellets shot out of a cannon that are each about the size of a grape. And, um, and when you fire that, what it happens, very much like a shotgun blast, the pellets spread out when you shoot them. And this allows you to attack a wider range of people. And so when he, when he leads this defense, he says he subdues the royalist revolt with a whiff of grape shot, meaning he fired grape shot into the crowd and probably ended up killing a bunch of people as a result of it. Um, but anyhow, this subdues the rebel revolt, and he's hailed as a hero for defending the new government of the, of the directory that had just come into place. In 1796, the directory after Napoleon led this defense um, appoints Napoleon to lead a, a foreign army against Austria. Now, Napoleon had already distinguished himself with the directory as well as with his service during the earlier years of the French Revolution. When he is put to lead this um, only 12 pounds, wouldn't that be light? Yeah, I mean, uh, for yes, but I mean, Certainly there's, there's heavier ones, but if you imagine like a 12-pound bowling ball being shot directly at you at nearly the speed of sound, I mean, it's, it's going to do a serious amount of damage. Um, but there are heavier, there are obviously heavier cannonballs and larger cannons, but, um, but nonetheless, I mean, it's going to do a significant amount of damage. Um, yeah, I mean, just imagine like a cannonball and it only has to be maybe four or five inches in, in diameter, right, and weigh 12 pounds. I mean, it's going to do a significant amount of damage um, to a structure or to a ship or something like that. Um, okay, so in, um, in 1796, he leads this foreign, um, he leads this foreign army across the Alps which is a mountain range, which is always very difficult for troops, but he's hugely successful. And he wins this series of victories against the Austrians, and he just keeps on going. He keeps pushing and pushing and pushing through, and he led this expedition all the way to Egypt. So Napoleon has this massive campaign where he is doing a significant amount of damage to the foreign threats to France. Um, and defeating the Austrians uh, along the way. When he gets to Egypt, he's now a long, long way from home. And the British Royal Navy, which had a very significant naval power by this point, ends up pinning Napoleon down in Egypt. And so there's a battle in 1797 called the Battle of the Nile led by a guy named Horatio Nelson. And Horatio Nelson and a number of other British admirals are able to pin Napoleon down in Egypt. Um, and, um, and so basically what ends up happening is that uh, he does ultimately get defeated by the British Royal Navy in Egypt, but um, we're living in a time where communication across this across this span is very, very slow, and it would have been difficult for news of this defeat to make it back to France. And so he keeps these stories of him being defeated by the British Royal Navy and being pinned down, meaning, you know, basically forced to retreat. Um, he keeps these stories from reaching the French newspapers. And he continues to head back to France and be viewed as a hero because they don't know about everything that happened back in Egypt right away. And here's a young Napoleon uh, painting of him. Now, a lot of times people will say, oh, wasn't Napoleon the guy that was really, really short? To be honest with you, um, that's a little bit of revisionist history. The, the British... Um, you know, they they tell the story to make it to, to try to, you know, trash Napoleon. And so he gets written down in history books as being like this short guy. 
and indeed he was he was short by modern day comparisons for sure but diets of people and stuff like that weren't as good back in those days and um, so for his time he's a pretty average height guy he's about five foot six okay so not particularly tall really but not like you know not like five two or five three which I think Horatio Nelson was about five foot two or five foot three um, so there were other people who were certainly smaller than Napoleon. Napoleon, um, everybody always says, oh, he must have had this like short man complex or something like that, um, but which I guess could be true, but, but we don't really know that for sure. Napoleon was kind of an average height guy for his time. Um, and so, and even today, I think the average height of all, if you add all men together across the planet, the average height is about five foot eight. So it's not, uh, it's not like, it's not that short, you know? Um, let's see. Gareth, great question. If history can easily be re rewritten like that, does it mean a lot of things in history books are exaggerated? Well, um, today, less so. Okay, today less so. Um, I wouldn't say that history books are exaggerated in the sense that the stuff that they write is exaggerated. I'd say that the stuff that's written in history books has a tendency at times to create an effect where people have an exaggerated understanding of things. Um, the books are written by academics. It's, it's not like the books aren't trustworthy, okay? But as with any story, you're confined to the story that you're told. The only story that you're ever told is the one that you're told, right? And so the thing that gets tricky about studying history is uncovering stories that were not told, okay? To be a good historian is kind of like being a really good forensics investigator, all right? You're looking for evidence. You're looking for, um, you're looking for things that lie beneath the surface that may not be immediately apparent. And as a result of that, um, it is a, it's a difficult task because you're searching for evidence and sometimes evidence is destroyed. Um, when we talked about, for example, um, the age of exploration, when the Spanish and English and other people were coming over and setting up colonies in the New World, the Spanish went around and destroyed all these documents that Native American cultures had um, you know, in Central America, like, for example, the Mayan documents or the Aztec documents or the Inca documents. They took and they destroyed all of them, and that's a tragedy in history because it means that the stories there will never be completely told. Um, how do you know they are trustworthy? You have to believe what they tell you. Well, yes, there is some degree of quote-unquote belief, okay, that goes into it. Um, in order to understand whether things are trustworthy or not, it relies on people to ask good questions. Um, and thank you, Gareth, I appreciate that question because it's a great question. And then Arnoff, to your point, you have to believe what they tell you. Yeah, to some extent there is some degree of belief that goes into it, but I would, I would say that that goes into anything. Um, I read an article uh, recently about um, Genghis Khan and how Genghis Khan, um, that actually wasn't his real name, and it wasn't even how you really pronounced it. Now, now the degree to which this is significant to me is a little bit of a moot point, because um, if, you, if you bring up in a conversation, right, oh, uh, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about so-and-so, and you use Genghis Khan's actual name, no one's going to know who you're talking about. So, you know, in terms of that, everybody already believes that his name is Genghis Khan. So if we talk about Genghis Khan and we don't refer to him as what people already believe his name is, then you're going to confuse people and, and the point will be lost. And so, you know, and two, belief, belief to some extent is reality, right? I mean, 
Um, there's a whole lot of things that people believe with no evidence to support it, but nonetheless, they just kind of go throughout their lives believing it anyway. And um, and so, you know, there, with history, the idea is with enough academic, with enough people who are trained, with enough people who are, um, you know, who are well practiced in studying historical documents and writing academic journals and publishing peer-reviewed journals and stuff, the way that we come to a consensus on history is if enough people who are experts within a field have done studying and there's always questioning, you never stop questioning things, you're always as a historian asking new questions, but there are certain things that we can come to a conclusion in with history and we don't have to question them anymore. You know, we don't have to question whether or not the Earth is flat. We don't have to question whether or not we live in a heliocentric solar system. Okay, there are certain things that have been discovered, um, evidence uncovered, analyzed by many people throughout time, and that's... Um, I wouldn't say it's most of the time it's not what happened. Um, I wouldn't say that it's most of the time. I would say that that what happens in a lot of times is that history is only written from the perspective of the people who wrote it. And so the reason that we have to constantly be asking questions, okay, um, about history, you can't pull the story and say you find the real truth of the story. True, but it depends on, on what aspect you're talking about. Like when it comes to, for example, um, a battle, okay, like a military battle, right? Objectively, there's a, a, a winner and a loser of, of the battle, right? Um, and and so the the story of the um, the story of the battle is is still accurate in the sense that oh, say the you know the French were defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. Um, yeah, I mean, it, here's the thing, history, history is not, is not set in some ways. I, I, I need you guys to divorce your idea of, of um, the idea that history is like a math equation, okay? History is not like a math equation. Um, you know, it's not a Rubik's cube. There's no, there's no, um, there's no like set solution to it. What do you do after asking the question? You begin to do research to see if you can find evidence to support um, to support the answer. All right. Um, you the just like in a although history isn't like a math problem, the scientific method very much applies to history. All right. It, you know, with science, if you go in and you're trying to prove a point, you've already lost the battle. Okay, you've already you've already forsaken your credibility because if you're going into science trying to prove a point, that means that you're going to be excluding evidence. All right, that seemingly doesn't fit with the with the Point that you're trying to prove. So with history, you have to go on what the evidence tells you. And, and there are ways of analyzing evidence, all right, that will lead us to new conclusions and have throughout history led us to new conclusions. And, and just like a good scientist in history, there is, no, there is no point at which you say, oh, okay, well, let's just stop asking questions. All right, you're always, always, always going to ask questions, and some of those questions that get asked end up not having an answer. All right, that is supported by the evidence. All right, um, that's not true, um, Arnov. When I say searching through the evidence, I'm not talking about reading a history book. A history book is a secondary resource. Okay, I'm talking about primary resource documentation. All right, you have to go back to the physical documents, evidence, architecture, art, 
um, you know, ledgers, you know, ec economic ledgers, bookkeeping, okay? All right, those, those, those documents, all right, become historical artifacts, all right? Now, now, I'm not saying again that primary resources can't be manipulated either, but to give you an example of how good historians work, good historians are, are not only going to look at one piece of evidence, they're going to look at a whole host of evidence, and they're going to see how well that evidence or how, how poorly that evidence fits together. So for example, even if you have a, a piece of evidence that is historically doctored, okay, that whoever wrote it back in 1500, all right, um, purposefully misled people, there are going to be other pieces of evidence out there that will demonstrate that that document was falsified. And once that, when, once that piece of evidence has been shown to be inaccurate, then it now actually even adds further credibility to the argument that you're adding or that you're making because um, you have demonstrated that somebody was deliberately trying to misrepresent the, the truth in history, okay? And so, and so I don't agree with your assessment that you simply have to believe whatever you're told um, from, from the history books good history, new history books are being written all the time that begin to include narratives that weren't ever told in history before because of the investigative work of scientific thinkers, all right? Um, well, that's a complex question, and I really do want to give you guys time to work on this, but I'll address that, but then i got to move back to this and continue making our way through the PowerPoint. So why does the government hide a lot of things from us? Well, um, I don't know if you're meaning like UFOs or things like that, okay? Um, I'm not even gonna address that side of it because I think it's kind of preposterous. But, um, So, yeah, um, like a lot of secrets are already exposed with government. I mean, the best idea that I can support that coming from their, coming from their perspective, if we're talking about, for example, um, you know, global terrorism, okay, or something along those lines, there are, there's reasons that the government keeps secrets so that, um, so that from their perspective, for the sake of national security, all right, that, that they don't let information um, that is sensitive uh, freely flow about and, and weaken their position. Global politics is a chess game, and you wouldn't want to tell whoever you're playing chess with what your next moves are going to be. And so the government has a vested interest in keeping certain information pretty close to the chest. Um, so um, this whole class is based on the history book, so your point is invalid. Well, um, I mean, Arnov, that's, a, that's an easy statement to make, but it doesn't present a, a counter argument. Okay, you're simply, you're simply creating a null hypothesis, right? You're simply creating a null hypothesis without any, any evidence to support it. So I'd be happy to entertain your argument if you had one that was, that actually posed, oh no, I'm not, I'm not, it's okay, Gareth, I'm not uh, at all intimidated by it. Um, but again, you, you, Arnov, you can't just throw claims like that out there um, without having an alternative perspective to, to support it. And so if you'd like to tell me what the true, true story of Napoleon is for our class, I'd be more than happy to listen to it. You know what I mean? There's, there's one of those things where it's like, 
sure you can just you can just say oh it's all it's all a load of of hogwash and and you know not, there's no facts in it but what you're doing is every bit as 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 anti-intellectual as um you know just going on um twitter or something and posting a rumor about someone and it's completely not based in any sort of reality you know i mean it, it it's 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 um it's one of those things where you there are certain i'm not saying that the history books are wrong i'm sa i'm saying that there are elements of the story that if you have to keep in mind arnov the other side of the class is that I have a certain amount of content that um, I have to get through. And if we were really studying world history, think about that right there, okay? Um, it, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of years of humans on Earth's surface. There's no conceivable way. Um, well, I can tell you, Arnov, that this hat that Napoleon's wearing right here, okay, in this piece, I've seen this hat in real life, okay? Um, I went to a museum with a bunch of historical artifacts that were owned by Napoleon, and I've seen the bed that Napoleon slept, out, slept in on the field. I saw his officer's sword, not the one that's pictured there, but a different one, and... Um, and so, like, you know, it's the real truth of Napoleon. I mean, what, I don't know what you want for an answer there, you know, because I, I strive at all times to offer my students the real truth of everything that we, we talk about in this class, right? Um, and the, the truth, as we understand it, will change just the same way that the truths that we understand about science change, you know? And I, it, it you know... There are things that people thought to be scientifically completely true, you know, completely true and supported by all of the evidence available to them. But the, the point is the same, which is that they continued asking questions. They continued searching through evidence. They continued doing experiments, academic research, okay, and that, and that new um, evidence is being presented all the time to give us, an, at all times, a more complete um, understanding of history, right? So let's continue back here with, with Napoleon. All right. Um, Napoleon... Uh, <clears throat> okay, Arnoff. Um, so... Coup d'etat, this word here, coup, C-O-U-P, it's pronounced coup, d'etat, okay? Um, and in 1799, the directory lost control, all right, because people were losing confidence in the directory since it was this, um, it was really corrupt, and it, like I said, it had made these promises to assist certain people, and, um, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where, where when the people lose confidence in the government, you know, especially because these people are going to be inspired by the Enlightenment, when the government demonstrates that it's not protecting your life, liberty, or property, um, and in this case it's not coming through on the promises that it had made to fix the problems that France was still going through at this time, um, they start to become less confident in the government and more supportive of the idea of... of um, of, you know, having it overthrown. And Napoleon comes back from his long four-year foreign battles across um, Austria. And, um, and basically, he comes back from, from Egypt, and there's a number of people in the inner circles of government uh, who understand that the directory is failing. And they urge Napoleon to take political power. And as a result, in November of 1799, now he's the one who's actually leading a coup against the directory. Remember back in 1795, just four years earlier, he defended the directory and then went off to fight a bunch of foreign wars 
um, when he gets back, the directory is is no no longer something worth defending. And at this point, Napoleon runs this coup d'état, which literally translates to blow to the state, okay, which is where it's a sudden seizure of government, where the government is overthrown. Um, he came back from Egypt alone. To be honest, Neil, I would have to... It's not that all of his troops were killed. I don't think he came back completely alone. Um, um, I don't... His, his military... Um, he, he may have come back separate from his military, but I don't believe that his military was like all killed or something like that um, in in um, in Egypt. I think that it was um, one of those things where he got pinned down. He could make no more progress. He came back, and he still has forces because without them, when he comes back, he wouldn't have been able to run a coup without having a loyal military. And the people who fought with him, um, yeah, okay, so Gareth, great point. If Napoleon became a dictator, isn't that what the people overthrew in the first place? All right, yes and no, okay, yes and no. When Napoleon becomes the leader of France, um, he, he very much views himself on the same level as like a... Um, as a like a, a a Caesar of the Roman Empire, okay, kind of like a Julius Caesar sort of sort of figure. He he views as himself as a very emperor like figure. Um, however, however, um, it, you know, if you remember, we did an assignment where I asked you guys a question, which is, what are some of the benefits? of having a single ruler in place. Um, he escaped, Michael, good question. All right, he escaped and um, went back to France. And, um, and so <clears throat> when I asked you guys that question, what are some of the benefits of having a single ruler, a king or a monarch or an emperor or a dictator in power? It was interesting to read some of your answers for that because some of you in your answers wrote something to the effect of um, when you have a dictator in power, it makes it easy for them to make decisions. And um, there's less, you know, there's less arguing, there's less fighting between different, say, political parties or something like that. And so dictators um, are not in all cases um, on the same level of evil. All right, um, and and so you know when Napoleon becomes the new leader, the new military dictator of France, um, he does this as a way of establishing control. Um, they had a better army. Okay, um, in some cases that can be the case, um, and and in Napoleon's case that is true, uh, but. But, you know, the thing to remember about Napoleon is that when he becomes the leader of France, he's doing so to reduce corruption. He's doing so to fix the problems that the directory was unable to do or to fix themselves. And so people, you know, it's really interesting. The story with Napoleon is really interesting. We'll talk more about it in, in just a second here. Um, you know, because what you have to understand, France has been going through all this turmoil now for a decade. And there's been a lot of periods of time where things have been pretty chaotic. They've been fighting these foreign wars. They've been, they've been having, struggling with ineffective governments, experiments with, you know, the, the reign of terror and tons of people dying, um, and so on and so forth. And people are kind of getting tired of all of this turmoil. And they're look by the time that Napoleon, this is why you have to understand that, that they would make this. Going back to um, Gareth's original question, why would people take and put Napoleon into the position of essentially a dictator that they had, when they had just tried to remove their, their absolute monarch 10 years earlier? The answer comes down to, a belief in um, the ability of Napoleon 
to uh, stabilize the situation in France, all right? So the reason that people were in favor of Napoleon is because he had been fighting in favor of the revolution, but that the revolution itself had created such a level of chaos in France that things were really out of hand, and the governments that they had been trying to put into place that were more democratic in nature had proven themselves ineffective to fix the problems that France was facing. Remember that France has only been experimenting with these democratic governments for about 10 years. France has a history of centuries and centuries and centuries of absolutist style monarchical rule. The idea was, you know, if we bring back somebody who is enlightened, somebody who believes in the principles of the Enlightenment, which King Louis XVI did not believe in. Also, there's a big difference between Louis XVI and Napoleon in the sense of their upbringing. Louis XVI was raised at Versailles. He was raised with silver spoons. He was raised with all these, you know, uh, various uh, privileges and stuff like that. Napoleon, from the time that he was nine years old, went to military school, okay, and, um, you know, was educated and was a military hero and so on and so forth. And people believed that Napoleon was, was a better man. He may not have been of royal lineage, but that they don't want to bring back a king of royal lineage. They want to bring somebody in who is going to bring safety, security, and stability to France. Um, Arnav asked, why don't people just govern themselves and not have a person tell them what to do? Um, humans humans um, don't, I mean, in an ideal world, Arnav, where everybody made good decisions and everybody was, you know, equal or something like that and had equal ability and equal whatever, all right, um, maybe that would work. But, but that's not how people work. And, um, you know, people are not equal. People have all sorts of different um, interests and talents and also faults. And, um, and this means that people are going to make mistakes. Um, and the question is, to what extent is um, individual freedom to be sacrificed for the greater good of humanity, right? I would argue, Arnov, that, um, and there are many examples of this throughout history, if people are left to act um, solely pursuing their own individual needs, what ends up happening is that the needs of the group are sacrificed. The idea behind government is that you have a system that will um, put the needs of the group over the needs of the individual. And, um, and that people, you know, the reason we have laws that dictate traffic is so that people don't just act in their own individual interest and drive however that fast they want, blow as many stop signs or red lights as they want or whatever. There are laws to try to maintain stability for the greater good of everyone not just so that people can act in a, you know, careless fashion. And I would agree with the sentiment because as, as with many mammal populations, okay, um, as with many mammal populations, uh, humans are um, motivated as much by their own individual interests as they are by fear. And, um, you know, the, the less you know about the world, the more fearful and scary the world becomes. And in those cases, people who are just average, everyday, common people um, look to leaders to be able to guide them through times of trouble or difficulty. And, um, you know, I would argue that in the midst of the Great Depression, had there not been a president who had demonstrated very sound leadership and enacted laws that were for the benefit of the people that it would have lasted a lot, a lot longer. And so, um, you know, that's, that's why we have governments is, is, you know, governments, I know that um, it's easy to 
to criticize the government, but again, you have to understand that the mere ability to criticize the government is itself a freedom that very few people throughout history have been afforded, okay? Um, and so, I mean, I'd say your individual freedom is taken by other things than the government. <laughs> um, who's, yeah, I mean, who's taking your individual freedoms away? You know, um, and so, I mean, yeah, I, I, I get you. Um, and it's lucky that you live in the United States then, because there's a lot of other places that you could be living in the world, Arnov, uh, that would not even grant you basic freedoms um, or the ability to speak your mind. Um, I mean, Arnav, the mere fact that you're able to even have these conversations with me and ask questions without me, um, you know, getting mad at you or whatever should demonstrate to you that you're in probably a pretty good system, you know, um, and I am paid by the government. So, um, you know, but my job is to get you to be a better thinker and not be somebody who is just controlled by impulse and that would be individual impulse, right? Um, and if people were able to just be individually free and act on their own individual impulses at all times, it would create a lot of problems for society. Um, so moving forward here, uh, after, after the, or well, during the coup, um, France is still at war, obviously, and um, Britain, Austria, and Russia, they see Napoleon overthrow the Directory, and they are all very, very, very um, concerned about this. But nonetheless, th as much as they all wanted to see Napoleon taken out of power, essentially through both using war and diplomacy, um, he got all these other nations to sign peace agreements by 1802. And... Um, Uh, let's see here. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so anyhow, um, yeah, I don't know who that is, but anyway, um, the coup d'etat, all right, um, basically through war and diplomacy, nations signed peace, we, pre, peace treaties with France by 1802. However, these peace treaties are going to be short-lived, and that's because um, Britain is not going to be comfortable with Napoleon as their military leader in power. The British knew, um, the British knew that Napoleon was a major threat, and they knew that he had a huge military that was loyal to him. And so um, it made him a, and two, he was a military genius, okay? Napoleon, the moves that he made on the battlefield. Now, of course, he's a man of his time. Napoleon's military today would not stand a chance against the American military with modern technology and stuff, all right? But in his time, um, Napoleon was, was really, um, was really uh, you know, unpredictable on the battlefield. All right, and um, as a as a byproduct of that, um, he he managed to uh, you know instill a lot of fear into these um, into these other foreign nations. Okay, yeah, just ignore all that, folks, and just um, and just continue here. So, um, how how does how does Napoleon rule? Um, how does Napoleon rule? He made himself look like he was chosen as a leader through a constitution. And so one of the things that's really interesting about Napoleon is, uh, you know, to give you an example, let's say that we had the whole class here in the classroom. And I asked you guys, you know, what do you want for lunch today? Or I'm sorry, I, let's say that I, I bought everybody pizza for lunch, okay? Let's say I bought everybody pizza for lunch, and you guys eat pizza, we get done, and then I say, hey guys, who wants pizza for lunch today? And then you're all like, 
Yeah. Well, yeah, we just, we all just ate pizza. That's kind of how Napoleon goes about doing this. He overthrows the government, okay? He overthrows the government. He writes up a constitution, all right? And then in the constitution, he basically says to people, um, you know, I, Napoleon, uh, am going to be your new leader. Who all supports this? And then everybody's like, well, yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, you already, you, you kind of already threw, overthrew the government. So, yeah, I guess, I guess we support it. Okay. He kind of using, using this constitution, which he has people vote on. He sets up this thing called a plebiscite or a vote of the people to approve this new constitution. They read the constitution. They're like, yeah, well, I mean, you, you did kind of already overthrow the government. And uh, since you won all these battles and we like you, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we approve, right? Like it's kind of one of those things where he makes himself seem like he was chosen democratically somehow, even though if we're being honest, he technically just ran a military coup and overthrew the government before writing the Constitution. So um, he ends up keeping most of the changes from the revolution. Okay, he ends up keeping most of the changes from the revolution. Um, and he supported a very strong central government. Um, he, he wanted to strengthen the economy first, and so one of the first things that Napoleon does is he sets up a national taxation and banking system to try to stabilize, his Fran stabilize France's um, economic situation, which was still struggling um, because wars are very costly to wage, and the French Revolution was brought about by a bunch of economic problems anyway. And so um, he's trying to kind of get all of that corrected right away as soon as he becomes the leader of France. Um, the other thing that he did was Napoleon goes about and, and dismisses all of these previous government corrupt officials. Anyone who was a legit um, government official who was a hard worker who was honest, who did their job well, he kept. Anyone who was corrupt, who was making backdoor deals with people, who was demonstrating them to be themselves to be, um, you know, against the best interests of the French state, gets fired. And what he does to replace these people is he sets up these things called lyces, which are government-run public schools that forced people, like today, if you want to become, you know, going back to this idea of education, if you want to become somebody in a particular professional field, whether that's a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever number of other things, accountant, um, manager of a business, you name it, okay, um, you're, you're going to want to be educated on how to do that job well. And, um, you know, not just hire people based on, oh, who are you related to or how much money do you have? You want people who have an education, who know how to do their jobs properly. And that is um, a, a pretty cool thing. You know, even in modern day times, if you wanted to become like, let's say, an ambassador for the United States, you have to take a test. Um, what is the test called? Um, the Foreign Service Exam. OK, the Foreign Service Exam. You have to take this test in order to to become uh, an ambassador. Okay, there there's certain things that the state wants to know that you're able to do, that you have enough knowledge and capacity be, to be able to perform that job. And Napoleon in Europe is one of the first people to start properly training government officials to be able to perform their jobs well. Um, also, at this time. Um, the clergy and the peasants, remember that the peasants are going to be really religious. They're very strongly Catholic. And when the French Revolution went through that radical phase during the Reign of Terror where Robespierre had gotten rid of the Catholic Church in France and changed the calendar and stuff, it really ended up making a lot of people in France, French peasants in particular, angry because their religion was important to them. And Napoleon understood this. And so one of the changes that he does make to France to try to get the peasantry on his side is to say, look, I understand that Catholicism is important to many, many French peasants. And so Napoleon signs something called the Concordat 
or an agreement with the Pope and invites the Pope to come to Paris and invites the Catholic Church back into France, restores the traditional calendar of January, February, March, etc. All right. Uh, but, but what he does do in terms of keeping um, uh, changes of the revolution is he sets up a barrier, a wall of separation between church and state. Okay, so he invites the church back in terms of private worship, but he does not bring the church back into the government. He retains separation between church and state, which is a very Enlightenment-inspired ideal. And so this, this is favorable to everyone because the Enlightenment bourgeois educated class in France is like, yes, keep the church out of government. Okay, but the peasantry is like, bring the, back, the church back to France, all right? So at least we can worship and stuff like that without fear of our lives. And so this gained Napoleon a, a huge amount of approval by virtually eg every segment of society in, in France. And here's some other um, images of Napoleon. Um, and he also creates a brand new set of laws called the Napoleonic Code, which eliminated many of the injustices of the French legal system uh, from, from earlier years. And so, you know, in this Napoleonic Code, I will say that it is a little bit stricter uh, in some ways, but it's, it's, they have limited liberty, okay? They have limited liberty. Um... Yeah, Gareth, that all died. That was very, very short-lived. He, he prayed to the goddess of, um, yeah, I think it was the goddess of wisdom. But, you know, he, he here's the thing. Um, have you ever heard of a phrase called, it goes like this, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. How many, has anyone ever heard of that phrase before? Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. All right. The idea being that Robespierre, when he first came into power, I mean, he's, he's one of these guys who really was an educated man who by all indicators was going to be a really good leader of France. But as he became more and more and more powerful, he also became more and more and more corrupt. And if you watch that documentary, you might have heard that his nickname was literally the incorruptible. Okay, but but as you found, he started going cuckoo for cocoa puffs, and he started doing all these crazy things, like you know, uh, having this this massive display where he's praying to the goddess of worship and doing all these things where he's executing people without proper trials and all this stuff, and he really becomes extremely corrupt. And so, um, you know, the question is, is Napoleon going to be able to avoid this same, uh, this same problem, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is awesome. Who's stale jello? Who said that? That is hilarious. I am so stealing that. That is that is absolutely brilliant. I love it. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. That's hilarious. I love it. Okay. Um, as a history teacher, those are the jokes I, I definitely approve of. Um, okay. So, freedom of speech and, and press were restricted, right? I can't get over that. That's awesome. Um, Freedom of speech and press were restricted. Now, of course, freedom of speech and press were, were huge, huge parts of the American Constitution, right? Um, the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> and so anyhow, um, the, Napoleon limits that. And the reason that he limits it is because um, in France, if you remember that guy, Jean-Paul Marat, who was able to write whatever he wanted, it resulted in the deaths of a lot of innocent people. Okay, so freedom of speech in that scenario, and freedom of press in that scenario, allowed for, um, allowed for, um, 
you know, rumors and other misinformation to spread around um, that had that had significant effects on the French society. And Napoleon doesn't want to have these kinds of harebrained uh, rumors spreading around France that could be a threat to his rule or to the stability of the state. And so that's why he restricts freedom of uh, speech and press. Um, he also does this thing where the French had basically abandoned uh, their New World colonies over in the Caribbean and um, other places, uh, particularly, though, a colony by the name of St. Domingue, which is now modern-day Haiti, just off the coast of Florida, that used to be a French colony where they used um, slave labor to produce sugar. And the, the French had basically abandoned that colony and under Napoleon, he tries to restore slavery in that colony, and it does not work out. And this is, okay, to, to speak to the thing that we were talking about earlier, about not being told the whole story of history, all right? One of the stories that, that you have not been told, um, probably, you know, uh, in a lot of your uh, historical um, classes, uh, or history classes, is about something called the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution took place right at this time, right after Napoleon goes back to Saint Domingue, uh, which is, like I said, now modern day Haiti. He tries to restore slavery there, and the and the the you know the people in Haiti, which were was largely you know uh, African descent slaves, said, "Heck, no, you're not restoring slavery here." And this this society bands together, a slave society bands together, and overthrows French rule there within a few years. And um, the Haitian Revolution, if we're being honest about it, the Haitian Revolution is way more revolutionary than the French Revolution because the French Revolution was was initiated by people who already had some, some degree of wealth and influence and education, all right? People who were already close to the top of society. The Haitian Revolution was run by people at the very bottom of society, okay? And, and they overthrew not just the, the colonial government there, they, they overthrew the French, okay? One of the most powerful militaries and, gov and um, em empires on the planet at the time. And yes, Arnav, they, th they overthrew the entire government of, um, of the French at, at, uh, at Haiti, okay? At Saint-Domingue, okay? But the French were under, it was led by Napoleon at the time. Okay, so in other words, the Haitian Revolution successfully overthrows um, this this colony, all right, under Napoleon's watch, all right, and, and and the French, as this is happening, the French don't even recognize this as a legitimate revolution. To them, they look at it and they see it as just pure chaos, okay. The thing that's so amazing about it is how organized it was and how successful it was. It's the only, as far as I know, it's the only time uh, where a slave colony successfully overthrew their colonial oppressors. All right? It's hugely revolutionary. It's one of the most important events probably in all of modern history, and a lot of times people don't know about it. So anyway, um, we will uh, we will leave off the uh, the lecture there, folks. I'm going to take a few minutes here to get your um, second part of your vocab assignment put up onto Canvas, and um, and then we will we will proceed with the lecture on Thursday. All right, folks. Have a great day.